Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Welcome to the third annual Black Women Photographer Summit powered by Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. I'm your host, Chrissy, portrait photographer based in LA. And today we have a very special guest. Black Women Photographers in Adobe is so happy to have our keynote speaker, the Southside Chicago legend, Dana <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm so excited to talk to you. You're one of my favorite photographers of all time. Oh, I'm also from Chicago, so I'm like so stoked that you're here and like I get to talk to you and like share all this knowledge with all these other Black women photographers that are in the chat waiting to hear from you. Oh, you said you're from Chicago? Yeah, I'm from out west though. Where? Uh, Humboldt Park in Austin. Okay, yeah, I'm from 76 and Stony, so like South Side. South True. Side. Yeah, that's where my mama from. Oh, really? So shout out to all the Chicago babies, especially if you're in the chat with us today. Uh, we love you the mostest. Um, but let's start right at the beginning. We all want to know like where it was, how it was that you fell in love with photography. Well, uh. I've had a bit of a winding road, but essentially maybe the first photo that I took that I thought was a good photo was actually a pile of horse shit. Um, I was in, um, I was helping a friend out on a short film and I was doing the costumes for it. And we were walking in like a park reserve and uh, he had a stills photographer on it and he, he like let me use his camera. And I was just like, clicking pictures or actually no the, that was the first picture I took was of a pile of horse shit and I looked at it and I was like that's a beautiful shit it was just like a really like uh and then I had an Etsy shop that I named that after it was called beautiful shit with a y oh cute um, yeah but but yeah I was like wow this is a, a pretty good photograph and then I took a photo of the guy who was the boom operator mm. and he was like the light was the sun was setting and and like you know, it was just like backlit and it was just like very pretty. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like, a like you can take a, I'm just not even trying, I'm just clicking and it's like a really professional looking photo. Uh, so that's like the first time I guess I thought like, oh, that's a really, you know, like I like taking pictures, but I didn't really think of it as like a career or anything. And uh, essentially the catalyst was when I, uh, was just going through a period of severe depression and I was too depressed to leave my house, too depressed to work. Um, and I needed to pay my rent. So uh, at the time I was living in Chicago and I had an apartment that was full of vintage clothes and furniture because I just liked to collect uh, vintage stuff back then. I still do kind of, this is, yeah. this is vintage and there's a bunch of other stuff around here that's vintage, but um, yeah, I just like to collect that stuff. And I was like, well, why don't I just sell all this so that I can like afford to live since I don't want to do anything else. And so I just started, um, you know, taking photos of stuff with like a really crappy camera. And I was like, this doesn't look right. Everybody on Etsy brings their A game and like nobody's gonna buy this. Like I had stuff like on hangers and stuff and I was like, it's just not gonna work. So I ended up uh, asking my mom to help me get my first camera, which was a, ca a Canon T2i. Mm. T yeah, T2i, that was my first camera like with a little kit lens. And, um, and then I found models on Model Mayhem or I guess that's like not the place you should name anymore, but I found models online and um, and have the model for my Etsy shop in exchange for like clothes and photos. And uh, and that's where I started. And I would just post my photos on that website in order to get more models, not really thinking, oh, I'm a photographer now, or I'm trying to be a photographer. But then agencies started reaching out to me to test with their models. And so I thought, oh, maybe this is a thing. Maybe I am, you know, I could be a photographer. And um, and then within a year or so, I ended up moving to New York to pursue photography as a career. Uh, but I really just had no concept of how to go about that. I just kind of took a leap, which is, I think, what you have to do in life in general in order to just keep moving forward. Definitely. One of the um, 
a quote I like to live by, maybe even might be a mantra, is take a leap and a net will appear, which is also a really good book to read if you're into some self-help. But that sounds incredible to me. It's like you were really pursuing an Etsy shop and <laughs> you found yourself as being an incredible photographer. How were these people reaching out to you at the time? Was it like Instagram or... Uh, no, it was just the agencies that were repping models. They were just finding them a model. They found me on Model Mayhem. So they just like reached out to me on Model Mayhem and asked me if I would test with their models. It was just like free tests. Yeah. It wasn't like I was getting paid or anything. But I just started, uh, like one of the first girls I tested with, she's like a big uh, like influencer now. I, I just like found her recently and I was like, oh my God, I took her photos when she was like 15, but uh but yeah but she's like a huge influencer now and um and so it's kind of interesting to see like the trajectories of like my first so my first like test shoots and those people and where they are now but um uh but anywho yeah yeah I mean, you're talking about taking this leap in like the transitions of your models how did you know to take that leap and to be like okay actually I want to take this more seriously well you know I was really uh you know I, I feel like I just have like such a long story and I try not to tell very long stories because I will ramble forever but uh you know I just had yeah you know I just had nothing else to like look forward to I think that sometimes we get to a point in our lives where maybe we failed at the thing that we thought that we were going to do or failed at like a bunch of different things, which I failed at a lot of things. And I think I just hit the point where I was like, there's nothing else I can draw offer. There's nothing else I can do. Uh, like, I'm just like, this is the rest of my life. It's just not being anything or anyone or doing anything with my life. Like, I'm just gonna, and that's why I was like, it was, it was a multitude of things, but I was just very depressed over those. And so like, of those ideas and those those uh, belief systems that were kind of like recycling in my brain. Um, so I think one, if you're thinking those things, the main thing you have to do is to change the way you think. And I used to think it wasn't possible, but you know, when a negative thought or something that's like when you're just being mean to yourself comes into your head, you just have to say, no, that's not true. You're being mean to yourself. Stop it. And like that really, like when I really changed how I would how I thought when I realized that like I was the cause of all my own you know uh misery you know what I mean from you know just negative self-talk and like also lack of direction and lack of you know um uh initiative you know if you're not doing anything you're it's a self-fulfilling prophecy you know like so yeah if you're not you know like you're not going to achieve anything if you're not doing anything. Yeah. So, you know, I just started doing things, started thinking more positively. And then I had a friend, which I still was kind of going through it, but I had a friend at the time who was living in New York and she told me, you know, why don't you just move to New York and, you know, and see what happens if you move here. And for some reason that kind of clicked in my head and I was like, you know what I am, I'm going to do it. And I just sold everything in my apartment. I sold my car. And within like a month or two, probably like a month and a half or something like that, I moved to New York and I only knew one person uh, and actually two people. And, you know, but I hadn't been to New York uh, since I was a little kid. So it was just like a, a brand new experience. It was like landing on Mars, to be honest. Like I just, the, the energy, the intensity, just the trains, it was like, you know, I felt like, you know, I was in a sci-fi movie, like just like on a, an alien mining planet or something. Everything's dirty. <laughs> it's just like really funny, but. Literally. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible that like the way you describe that version of yourself today, you know, she was really going through it. And yet still that version of yourself is incredibly brave to start over and start new in that way, in a very big, scary kind of way. And she brought us who you are today and started you off on your journey to becoming a photographer, full-time photographer and director. And I'm really curious to know like what your creative process has blossomed into. Cause I imagine like it must've been like pretty difficult at the time to like balance being a creative and like surviving. Mm -hmm. New York and you're just like figuring it out and you only know one person so what has it grown into since then um 
well, I think like, excuse me. Um, I think it's really important when you're first starting out, especially to shoot as much as possible. So even when I was like, not, you know, even when I at a certain point was working like two jobs, you know, and was like working one job in the morning until like four or five and then working the next job from like six to midnight, I was like still shooting. You know, I would like, you know, if I had the morning off, I would, you know, shoot for, you know, have a model come to my house at like 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. And then we would shoot for like an hour or two and then I would go to work. And, you know, so I think that a lot of times people make excuses as to like, I'm too busy to to shoot. I'm too busy to like, uh, to make work. And it's like, I've been like super, super busy in the sense of like, just like doing soul crushing, you know, like monotonous work that just doesn't yeah. fulfill me at all. But that was what was like keeping me going was these, you know, these test shoots that I was, you know, doing. Cause I could actually, my goal really was just to get paid to do tests. Like I, I didn't have like some brand, you know, uh, uh goal for most of the, the time that I was shooting early on I just really wanted to get you know like two hundred dollars <laughs> to <laughs> you know sh shoot a model so you know but uh but yeah that process you know like when I first moved here I didn't you know I was just living on my savings of e from everything that I had sold and so I was just shooting constantly I was shooting like four or five six people a week like mm -hmm. I was just you know like just banging it out and you know and my work developed really quickly because I was just the constant repetition of like shooting and I and, and I didn't have a studio I would just shoot on street corners I would shoot you know a handball course that was like my handball court uh, in whatever neighborhood that I was living in that was my studio so I was always shooting at a handball court I was always shooting on street corners um I was shooting um a model Tyler Riggs uh, because this was back when I was like mainly just shooting men. Uh, I was shooting him on a street corner, and like the editor in chief of uh, Details Magazine, which was like a big men's magazine uh, back then, it it went away. But he like rolled by on his bike and recognized Tyler, and you know like they chatted. And then before he was about to roll off, I was like, "Hey, can I get your email?" And then I would I emailed him like once a month for a year. And he only responded the first time. He was like, oh, because I sent him the photos of Tyler. And then and then he was like, oh, thanks for, you know, uh, sending. And I'll keep you in mind for anything that comes up. And then uh, and then I never heard from him. I, like, would email him, you know, new work every month for a year. And then one day I was like, you know, I would email him from different email addresses because I thought that he was, like, uh, you know, thought, thinking I was stalking him or was just, like, blocked right. me or whatever. And I would always, I would just basically be talking to myself. I would talk about the weather. I would just go back from Chicago. I would just, you know, I would just like, you know, just have the whole conversation like we've been talking, but literally he's not, you know, responded to me once or only one time. And then one day I had shot this other model and I was like, oh, he probably would like these possibly, but I shouldn't even send them because he probably blocked me. So then I sent him the email and then five minutes later, he emailed me back and he was like, uh, thanks for sending uh, do you want to shoot for the September issue of details? And I was like, that was my first published job. And it took me almost a year <laughs> to, to get it. But, you know, it was basically like a GQ. Um, and it's it's not here anymore. But, but yeah, it was a big deal for me. And it was the first time, like, I work and they had, like, a trailer. We did shoot on a handball court, which was, like, my, you know, comfort space. But we shot in a park. I hated the image. It was garbage. I had a bunch of really beautiful shots and then they chose the worst image out of the bunch so that's also a lesson you know so I hate when that happens it's like obviously with their own creative direction they get to choose or whatever but it's like I see the image I see the one that should be the one yeah. I'll choose this other one yeah and that's why you have to you know be very precise with how you're editing you know, when you're sending, you know, when you're making those selections and those choices to send to an editor, um, like I will send the least amount. And then if they ask for more, I will send more potentially, uh, but yeah. most likely I'll send more, but like, if there's nothing else and I'm just like, there's nothing else, uh, or maybe there's one other, but like, I, you know, back then I used to send like so many, I would like send the whole, whole thing and just be like, please, you know, like me, please, you know, just like, 
you know, you just don't know. But now it's just like you have to really control your vision and you have to control like what the public is also seeing because the public is also like other editors and other creative directors who are in a position to hire you. So if they're seeing the worst out of what you're doing, or if they're seeing, you know, something that doesn't align with what you're capable of, then they're, they might not consider you for stuff that you would be right for. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. How do you gain that control? Like where, at one point in your career, were you like, you know what, actually, I'm only going to send these 30 photos. And if you ask for more, maybe I'll send the maybes that were in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, how did you gain that confidence? I think I just got tired of people choosing stuff I didn't like. Uh, I think I, I had shot a cover. It was one of my first covers. And I think I I just really didn't like the image. And, I'll, and it was an image that I thought, oh, like they might choose it for the inside. Or, you know, I just didn't think it was a cover image. Yeah. And they chose it for the cover and I was like, never again. And I also read, you know, uh, Herb Ritz, you know, used to only send like four or five images and I was at. And he didn't send anything else. I mean, he was Herb Ritz, he could get away with that. But, you know, um, but when I read that also, it kind of, you know, affirmed the idea that like, I'm on the right path of just like taking more control of, of the narrative and like, you know, and I think that that's really helped me uh, in terms of like what has been published and like, you know, establishing my creative vision and my capabilities as a photographer is, you know, you just have to like, you know, like, like just sit, like I, I used to get like nervous, like oh, I'm only sending 10, 10, 10 images and they're gonna like, you know, ask for more. But like sometimes, a lot of times they don't ask for more, sometimes they do. And I'll send like, you know, whatever I do feel like is possible. But, you know, um, but I will send the least amount. The, the ones that I think are the strongest, the ones that are like telling the story I wanna tell. And then if there's like something else that they're looking for, you know, I will send a few more, but I don't send like a ton. You know, if we do like a ton of looks, then yeah, I might send 30 images or more than that. But if we're only, if there's only like one look, like I'm not gonna send like 30 images, I'm gonna send like 10 or seven or something like that, so. Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. Um, I wanna like take a step back again where you were talking about how you were pitching yourself to this um, one guy once a month for a whole year. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it sounds like persistence is very important when it comes to pitching yourself. And I have kind of like a two-parter. So one, I'm curious if you still pitch yourself at this stage in your career. Mm -hmm. And two, what advice would you give to photographers, I guess really at any point in their career when they're cold emailing people? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I still do. You know, you still have to do outreach at every stage. And, you know, because there's people that don't know who you are or there are people that do know who you are. But so I'm drinking sparkling water and it's just making me belch but um but yeah there's people that know who you are and people that don't and the people that do know who you are sometimes they don't even think you would be interested in working with them or they're just like you know you're somebody that they've heard of and they're like you know you're not in their like thought process when they're making decisions so you know it's good to always like try to reach out to the brands or the you know um publications that you like um, I would advice I would just say is just keep your emails concise, you know, like uh, don't like say, oh, I would, you know, love to to shoot for you. And this is my dream. And ever since I was 10, I've worn Nike or whatever it is that, you know, anecdote, because it doesn't matter. Like you're you should always come off as like I'm a professional like this is, you know, like these are the services I provide. This is not services, but this is like who I am as an artist and I hope to work with you you know what I mean but like not as like a fan or whatever yeah. even though you might be a fan uh, or just you know gush even if you're not a fan like sometimes you're like kissing ass because you think that they will like care about that but I feel like most people just care about the work and you know and just present you know you know strong you know strong work that you know is also just edited you know sometimes you know when you're doing a, putting a portfolio together you just have like the same image 
in a different way, kind of three or four or five times, you know? So just being able to edit yourself is very important uh, because yeah, nobody wants to see like variations of an image. Like they want to see like a breadth of what you can do, but in a very concise way. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point in terms of like, like even just having a niche, which I'm curious uh, how you came up with your niches or how your niches may have found you. But even within your own niche, like there's a variety of type of shots you can tell how to uh, narrate your story through your variety of shoots on a portfolio, which is kind of basic. And we actually touched on a bit in some of our conversations yesterday, which is like, you know, you have your close-ups, your mids and your wides to tell full stories. And you can take bits and pieces from other shoots to create one narrative about the kind of work you can create. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can talk to us a little bit more about your niches and how you feel like you found them. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, as I mentioned previously, I mainly focused on the male form uh, for six and a half years before I got my big break. And, you know, at the time, it felt a bit fruitless because, you know, people would tell me, you know, you're only shooting men, you know, money is, you know, shooting women. And, um, you know, just nobody is, you're just not going to move forward doing that because there's just it's not a market even though I there is 100 percent uh for that but I would just get that feedback a lot and then also I was shooting a lot of guys that were like shirtless uh partially nude you know it was just mainly skin and that was what I really loved to focus on was skin was movement abstraction uh emotion and I think a lot of people were confused about what it was I was capable of because I would, you know, eventually when I figured out how to talk or how to meet with like more photo editors, I would get the feedback that, oh, I don't even know if you know how to shoot women because you only have men. And it's like, it doesn't matter who it is. Like, you know, if you're an editor, your job is to see the potential in somebody and to see that they can actually take a good photograph. It doesn't matter who's in front of the camera. And I also did have women in my portfolio, but my portfolio was mainly men. So I would get that feedback. And then a really big uh, owner of like a really big agency <laughs> here in New York uh, did a portfolio review with me. And he was like, oh, it's very beefcakey. And it's very like, uh, that's what he just, I just so he uses is like beefcakes. And, you know, and like his thing, you know, his agency is more like fashion. And okay. just like wayfish people and just, you know, more that. So it's just like, you know, that kind of like hurt my feelings when it happened. But it's like also like sometimes when you're getting uh, opinions and feedback from people, you're not always going to get feedback from somebody that understands what it is that you're trying to do because they want, you know, they have their own perspective. So you kind of, you know, I, I think... Sometimes feedback can be helpful, but most of the time I'm at least, you know, when it comes from a client, that's important. But when it comes from like outside forces that are like random people or maybe like some industry people, like I just take it with a grain of salt, you yeah. know, because um, especially early on, like I try not to give critique. Like I'm I'm somebody that I I really don't see the full value in critique because I think that a lot of times it stunts people's growth. Like if I had listened to him and just complete, completely pivoted in the direction of my work, because this is somebody who's like a, a real heavyweight in the industry, you know, if I had listened to him and said, you know, you know what, I'm going to like shoot more women or I'm going to shoot like guys wearing more fashion or clothes or whatever, like I would have probably not been as successful as I have been because I ended up because I've been shooting skin so much I shoot a lot of skincare campaigns you know shop for Glossier for uh skin which is Kim Kardashian's um skincare line uh uh shop the first launch uh when she launched the brand uh shop uh Sierra skincare line I've shot for L'Oreal you know so it's just uh you know that focus that I had and learning how to properly, at least in my mind, properly, you know, clean and clarify and highlight skin 
early on that translated to campaign work, you know, and client right. work later, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. And then all the movement that I was doing with the guys that translated to shooting athletes, shooting you know uh my first big campaign was with Nike and Rio de Janeiro like I like literally had gone from like literally no one feeling like no one you know would hire me to do anything and and feeling like I would never get you know to that level of shooting a campaign to like my first campaign being for like one of the biggest brands in the world in like Brazil so and you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's so fair. Um, since you're bringing up the work, I want to pull up the work so everybody can see in case they haven't already. But while we're doing that, um, since we're on the topic of like representation, agencies, publications, would you recommend representation for rising artists and photographers? I mean, I think that people should do what feels uh, right to them. Um, and then I also shot him for the cover of Time last year. Uh, so that was kind of a full circle because I shot for her skincare brand uh, in the same studio. And then like two years later, I shot her for the cover of Time. And then, uh, yeah, so this image on the far left, that's some work I did for Google. And this is also, a, you know, um, um, you know, I think it's important to make you know, to be creative and make personal work because um, I had started creating a multi-exposure um, series of work in Paris last year. And um, then I, I was in London for a job. I was in Paris for a job and I decided to stay an extra day and just choose something for myself and ended up coming up with this process. And then I went to London for a different job later and shot some male models again for multi-exposure. And then Google ended up reaching out and they had a new feature on one of their cameras where they can, um, uh, you can control the aperture and shutter speed and, you know, wanted to see what I could do with that. And, you know, I was able to like utilize their camera to, you know, basically create, you know, a cam campaign work based on some work that I had done in my personal time. So I got two shoots, you know, with Google out of, you know, me just doing like, investing in myself, you know, like booking a studio in a foreign country, reaching out to some agencies, you know, uh, just, you know, doing stuff on my own time. And yeah, this was Fantasia last year. Um, and this is Phyllis in the chat says, ooh, the Fantasia portrait, it looks like an oil painting chef's kit. Oh, and thank you. <laughs> yeah, we just shot that in the New York Times studio. And that was really, uh, it's just a really small studio in the New York Times building. And you can, you can make stuff happen out of any, you know, any space really, you just have to like utilize your, your, your resources. But yeah, and I shot the, all the key art for the color purple uh, movie. So that was kind of cool to like work with her again in the more creative space. Um, and then, so if you look at the boys, this uh, middle work, I'll go down right here. So this is the original work that I shot in Paris and London and just shot on my own time. And uh, and this work is, you know, my just my personal work that I ended up being able to get a Google campaign, uh, two Google campaigns out of. Uh, and yeah, so just really important to like, to take that time and, and and whatever little money you know you want to like spend to to invest in yourself in yourself, you know you should do it. So uh, I think that that's where it's like okay, um, you have this idea. I have a personal project idea. You commit to it. You create it. Did you pitch to Google? Did you just post it like on your website and somebody ended up finding you? What was your process like? Yeah, actually, I um, I posted on my Instagram and my uh, my website, and then I had reached out to uh, someone who is an agent at uh, a company, and just to like do like a you know just to have like a meeting, a portfolio review, and excuse me, one of his clients is Google, and um, I had shown him the work, and then I you know. We had somewhat kept in touch, but maybe like 
three, two or three months later, he reached back out and was like, actually, you know, uh, would you be interested in working with Google? Cause they have, you know, a new camera on their phone where you can control the shutter speed and the uh, aperture and see if you can like recreate some of that work that you've done previously, you know, on your own. So it's really good to like reach out to people just to, you know, not necessarily even for like, you know, like, oh, I want to pitch you an idea, <laughs> you know, like you should reach out to people just to show them your work, you know, portfolio review. And you just never know when it, it'll come back around. Okay. I'm actually glad you just said that because uh, Mona in the chat says, how do you go about setting up portfolio reviews with editors or agents? Whenever I try to email them, I get ignored. Um, well, you just have to follow up, you know, <sighs> Yeah, that's like the one the one thing that I would, you know, just tell people is, you know, it feels like a rejection when, you know, someone doesn't respond to you. And in a lot of cases, it probably is. But, you know, in that 1% of people that you reach out to, that, that one person that's like, you know what, uh, I see this person's email, but um, I'm busy. I don't, there's a lot happening right now. I'm going to like tuck that in for later. They might forget, but then maybe like a couple months later, you reach back out again and they're like, oh, you know, she reached out, you know, a couple months ago. I remember I know who she is. I might tuck that in there for again. And then he reached out again. And, you know, it's just like you just kind of like keep updating them with work. I don't you know, I always like make sure that I'm, you know, trying to and it's not always easy, but, you know, just following up is is a really important thing. So. Yeah. Um, since I love this cover uh, for, um, and somebody has a question about publications in the chat and it says, when you shoot for publications, oh, this is Mona again. When you shoot for publications, how much creative control do you have? And do you get to come up with the concepts or does the pu publication team do that? Um, you can come up with the concepts depending on whatever publication is you're dealing with. Some of them have their own concepts already ready and sometimes they want you to pitch. So if you go scroll all the way up and keep scrolling. So this Vanity Fair cover, well, actually both of the Time and the Vanity Fair cover, but this, the, the Time, the, the Vanity Fair, I had to pitch this idea. So it was, you know, I wasn't like, just like the person that they were gonna go with, you know, they were, you know, uh, talking to other photographers and I pitched them these, you know, this concept and this type of lighting or whatever. I don't even remember, but it was, it was along these lines and, you know, um, and they chose it. You know, I just wanted to, uh, these are all tennis players. They're the top seeded tennis players in the world. And um, we shot this in Paris last year during the French Open. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, I don't know what the other photographer or photographer's concepts were, but I try to like not go super literal all the time. I think with like athletes, sometimes people go very literal with like tennis balls and like, you know, uh, more athletic wear. And I really wanted to do something that was just fashion and um, that felt more elevated and more like a fashion editorial and that felt a bit more conceptual. So that's, you know, that's what I ended up pitching them was something that just felt a bit more, um, more fashion focused. And, you know, they didn't give me any direction at all when they were, you know, when they were, you know, asked me to put together the pitch. But um, yeah, with Kim, they, uh, you know, they they knew that I, they wanted me to shoot Kim, so I didn't have to like fight anybody <laughs> to to shoot Kim. But you know, I did have to come up with a concept, and so that that's one of the nice things about working with um, with Time uh, and like some of these, you know, and Vanity Fair and some of these publications is that they give you a bit of creative freedom where you can like really, you know, just you know, you have maybe not the biggest budget, but you have a budget to try things. So like this, you know, lighting and this, you know, set design I had never done before. So I wanted to like try that. And, you know, if I'm paying for it myself, it's going to be like a lot more money, <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, so I just, you know, I wouldn't, it's not something I would do just myself, you know, so you get the resources to be able to try out ideas, which is nice. 
Yeah, it's also, I feel like, really affirming for a lot of people to know that there are publications that will reach out to you for your style. And it's not always mm -hmm. like a battle of trying to fit yourself into something. Yeah. Um, which I also feel like a lot of folks want to know who is it that they should be looking to pitch to at these mm -hmm. publications and agencies. I mean, you know, photo editors, photo directors, visuals directors, those are the people that, you know, at publications are the ones that choose. With Sierra, if you go to that, um, if you go back to the motion uh, with Sierra on the, on the right. So this was her um, skincare line that she launched uh, two years ago. And I did Creo directed all of this. So like the concepts, the um you know for the stills and the motion uh, and yeah just basically the whole you know from scratch you know so that was kind of cool to um to be able to do especially with somebody that's you know such an icon like Sierra mm -hmm. um, yeah this looks beautiful thank um, you I didn't know you also directed film yeah. that's amazing yeah, I direct, I creative direct, I, you know, con concept, <laughs> you know, so uh, you have to learn how to wear a lot of different hats, you know, especially like sometimes like depending on who you're working with. This one, you know, this is, I don't love this video, <laughs> but it's there. It, you know, it, it turned out okay. Uh, <laughs> so I have it, I have it up, but um, it's okay, we can go uh, to yeah, but the, if you go skin by Kim Kardashian, that you know that's a bit more polished, and I just liked these. We there there were more vignettes uh, than like you know less narrative, but more like vignettes. But I think everybody looks really beautiful. The lighting looks really beautiful. The skin yeah. looks gorgeous. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of what I'm. A lot of what I'm known for is skin, so I do like doing beauty and skincare. If you go to the bottom left, or, or I thought you were going to stay on there, but um, if you go to uh, this first one, that's for the Tonys. So I work with the New York Times a lot, or I've been working with them a lot more recently. Mm -hmm. And um, I really love working with them too, because you, you know, they don't really give you any direction. Sometimes they might give you a little something, but most of the time you kind of just like do what you want to do and with this it was a pretty big job because I was shooting all the Tony nominees uh this year uh and or all in the acting categories um and we were shooting them uh at this big press junket that they have right after they are nominated and uh it was just it was it was very intense um I did have to come up with the concept and um I didn't want to do something that was just super basic because you know, they're, uh, even though I'm only getting like maybe a minute to two or three minutes with each person, I didn't want it to feel like picture day. Like they were just showing up and sitting and being present. And I really wanted to push myself to make portraits that felt more interactive, that felt more emotional and connective. And, um, and so just really like, one thing I've learned over the years is just how to like, get people like kind of break down these like emotional like barriers within people's minds to kind of just get them to to do things that you know just feel less you know like I'm I'm here I'm you know I'm like just a I'm present you know what I mean so I just try to push people with with you know politely but push people a little bit within that short period of time I have and give them direction because most people want direction you know if you're just telling somebody just oh like just sit there and you know you're not giving them anything they're not going to give you anything but if you're giving them an idea a concept something to act out uh and these are all actors so you know it's kind of uh you know not all actors want to do stuff when you ask them to that's also a thing but um but I just really love how these uh portraits for the Tonys came out because they just feel uh just more editorial and uh, and just more connected uh, than just like, you know, like I just asked them to sit and pose, you know, they're kind of, they're more engaged. So. Uh, I really love your approach. And since we're talking about that, 
Benicia King in the chat asks, um, when working with brands, uh, editorials or pubs, are the companies providing your team or do you create your own team? How does that work? Right. Um, I really love this image. This is of the, um, the cast of Stereophonic, which was nominated for a ton of Tony Awards this year. But um, yeah, I uh, it depends. So if you're, and I, this is like actually one of my favorite images from the day. <laughs> it's just- The hair yeah. is- What are you gonna say? No, I said the hair is incredible. This is sickening. Yeah, and it's like a hair campaign almost, you know what I mean? But <laughs> yeah, but you know, but she's like, you know, like, when you, like, I think that people, when they see certain, you know, when they see people, they don't, they have like a concept of what this person is like or what this person is willing to do or not willing to do. And I think it's always important to just try to, what just ask, just like, you know, ask, you know, if you need the shot enough, another time, if you need it two or three times. I think we did like, I think she shook her hair, like, you know, maybe three or four times. I only had like two or three shots of this. We got it like, like that. And, you know, um, and I shot all this on film too. So, um, so yeah, it's just like one of my favorite photos of the day and you just wouldn't expect. And it's just like, there's such a like, I don't know. She just feels very like in herself, like very like feeling herself, very like just soft, but also like sexy. I don't know. There's just like a thing happening with this photo that I just, I really love. And it's just not expected, I think, you know. Yeah. I think it's it's definitely in her facial expression. She looks super calm, super comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a bit of like allure to it too. Allure, that's a great word. Yeah. 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 It definitely, it makes you stop and be like, wait, where was she at? Like this exactly. <laughs> with her little lace on, you know. <laughs> um uh, but but back to Benicia's question for your team for something like this or this one in particular were you mm -hmm. able to build your own team uh so for the it depends on you know uh what the publication is but for so like you do get a budget so for the times you know the budget is is somewhat limited so i end up you know if i'm having you know uh a team depending, you know, I might pay them more than what, you know, what the Times or whatever publication has allotted for assistance, because, you know, they're a journalistic publication, so they just don't have the same type of budget as, like, a big brand or, like, um, you know, a bigger publication, you know, so you just kind of, like, it's like the prestige of working with the Times, you get access to incredible people, so, you know, it's just, you kind of have to just, like, figure out like what, like how much do I want to invest in this shoot in terms of like assistance? What can I do for myself? This one was a bigger concept and a bigger job. So there was more budget and I was luckily able to get uh, two of my like really strong assistants on this because things are just moving really fast. You know, like I said, I was shooting film. So we needed to be able to, you know, reload our film quicker. I did shoot like some digital for safety, which I always do because you just never know. Yeah. But um. But yeah, so uh, so yeah, but there's other publications. Like I feel like more fashion publications, not necessarily a Vogue, but like some of the smaller fashion publications, you really pay for everything. You know, they might give you a small budget, like they might give you like, you know, a small amount to offset some of your costs. But, you know, shooting for fashion, like you're coming out of pocket. So that's why a lot of people that do shoot fashion, they have their own studio. Uh, cause it's cheaper than like, you know, shooting, you know, uh, trying to, you know, rent a studio all the time or, um, or rent equipment all the time. Uh, I've done shoots for, fa uh, like one fashion publication. I really love working with them, but like, I spent so much money that I was just like, I don't want to do this again for a while <laughs> because, you know, you have to pay for, you know, like if you're shooting fashion, fashion, you have to pay to get all, all that stuff shipped from Europe or wherever, uh, you can offset some of those costs with a stylist, but it's still like a lot of money to ship all that and to ship it back. And then, um, you know, you have to pay for their assistance. You have to pay for, you know, makeup, hair, uh, you know, makeup and hair. They might, you know, only charge you a kit fee, but they their assistants also need a rate. 
Uh, so you're paying for that. You need to pay for catering. You need to pay for lights, equipment, a studio space if you don't have one. Uh, so it just all adds up. And, you know, so it's just, it's, I feel like I want to shoot more fashion. I enjoy it, but it's just a, a harder nut to crack because yeah. I think it just, you just have to spend so much money. And like, I just, I just don't feel comfortable spending that much money on each shoot. Cause I don't have a studio. Um, I don't have, um, uh, a ton of my own lighting equipment. It's just a real investment. And it's kind of like starting all over again, you know what I mean? But, um, um I feel I like, you know, probably to like really be to committed to that. What did you say? That would have to be your niche probably to really commit to that. Cause that's yeah, a lot. It is a lot. So, um, yeah. And I'm just, you know, I, I like the idea of shooting fashion and I definitely want to do more hopefully, but like shooting for the, I'd rather like, hopefully like bigger publications reach out to me to shoot because they'll not have a budget, but right. the smaller publications, the cool publications, you see all these cool, you know, magazines. They're cool, but they just don't have the budget. So you really have to like, as a the photographer, you really have to invest in like in whatever shoot you're doing. Yeah. yeah. And they don't tell you that. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, <laughs> speaking about all of this, like costs and stuff with the last couple minutes before we get into our editing process, I want to take the time to talk about like, how do you go about um determining your worth which I feel like is always such a weird hard question and even statement that people always ask but like how do you determine your worth at your stage of your career um when you're in negotiations with publications and companies to book a shoot well most publications have set rates so excuse me um they have set rates so you can't really like change how much they're going to pay you. Like most publications only pay $1,500 for a cover. Like that's just like across the board. Most of them don't pay that much, but you get a cover. <laughs> so, um, and you also get resources to, you know, uh, to, to do something more conceptual or you get access to a, a celebrity or whatever. And they just, it's, it's an elevation. So, you know, at a public, uh, if you're working editorially, like that's just not, you know, you can make money if you're doing a lot of it, but it's a lot of work and you don't get as much of a return mm -hmm. uh, financially, but editorial feeds your commercial work. So it's important to get editorial work because clients that are, you know, brands, you know, they see a cool shoot that you did for a publication and like, oh, like I want to work with her or him because you know, he shot for this, like, you know, the, the celebrity I love or like that she turned out really well or whatever. Like, it's all a cycle. Uh, yeah. So I think that when it comes to brands, it just varies. You know, sometimes they have like really big budgets and, you know, sometimes they don't. I like to ask, you know, what's, you know, what, what rate are you offering for this job before I throw out a number? Because sometimes you will throw out a number that is way less than what they were willing to, to pay. So you might be, maybe they had $10,000 for you for the day, but you said 2000 and they're like, sure, let's do it for $2,000 or let's do it for 500. You never know. Cause you just don't know. Like, especially when you're starting out, you might throw out a number that seems high to you, but it's actually not that high. So it's, I feel like it's better to ask and like, you know, I follow, even if they're like, oh, well, we just want to know what you, uh, what would do it for. I, I respond back and I'm just like, you know, um, it's like I, in a nice way, I'm just like, well, you know, I think it, it will be easier for us to like get on the same page or whatever. If we, you know, I just know where you're starting from, you know, and, um, there's a, there's a nice way of doing it, but and usually I'll get a number and then we can go from there. Um, sometimes I'll reach out automatically and tell you how much they're offering. So then, you know, you you just have to decide if whatever it is that they're offering within the scope of work that they want you to do is worth it for you. So, um, yeah, I think that that is, that's how you determine is like, is this too much work for not that much money? 
and maybe the brand has some prestige. So maybe that will be helpful to you moving forward. So it might be worth it. But if it's like very little money, a lot of work and, you know, maybe you don't have creative control or, or whatever, you know, whatever things that, that don't make it worth it for you, then maybe you should pass, you know? So like there are things that I've passed on that, you know, it just didn't feel right. Sometimes it's just a feeling, you know? Uh, and sometimes it's, you know, it's just not like, it's just too much work for not enough money. And yeah, so. That's basically how you negotiate then. Like, cause it's really easy to get caught up in like the back and forth of like, well, what's your rate? And then, well, what's your budget? And then they go yeah. back. Well, we want to know just like how you said. Yeah. And so basically when you get to that point, it's just like, okay, let's look at what they are asking for versus this price and then add a little tax? Um, I, you know, I do t uh, tax depending. So sometimes like the rate is good and I just don't want to rock the boat. So I'm just like, sure, let's go. You know, but like, uh, but sometimes like, I'm like, yeah, let's add more. And sometimes we have a really good producer. Like I, you know, sometimes bigger brands will reach out and they want a bid. And so you have a producer that you bring on board prior to being hired and they will put together a bid of like all the costs, everything that's going to, you know, like add into it and they'll create a budget. And, you know, sometimes a producer like the, they might come in with like a really low budget and I've had a producer literally triple a client's budget and, and submit it. And then they said, yes, because sometimes also like brands will come in with a very low number because one, they might not know how much it costs to make something. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I've had a brand from like New Zealand shoot here and I shot a campaign for them and they just didn't really know how much it would cost to do what they wanted to do. And we, you know, we just bid on the job and we're like, you know, this is how much it's going to cost. And, uh, and they accepted it. And then, you know, and then sometimes I think that they do it as a test because I had another really big job. It was a, a big, big job for a really big brand. Uh, and it was like multiple, it was shot over multiple weeks. It was like different celebrities, different like influencers. And we were just shooting all over the country. And, um, I was bidding against one other photographer and her, uh, agency was bidding on the job for her cause they were going to produce it. And so they created a bid that was so low. Like it was just like not feasible to be able to do a shoot of this scale and scope for what they pitched it at. And we put in a pitch of like what it would actually be. We, we bid it at a number that like, this is actually how much it's gonna cost. And the brand ended up going with us. So it's not always like what's cheaper because a brand will look at a bid like that. And if they are have been around the block, they know like there's no way that you're gonna be able to do this at this rate. So you're either underbidding to try to get the job, get the job or to you have no concept of what it takes and how much it costs to actually do this. So we're gonna be like struggling throughout this. So you're gonna be asking for more money or you're like not gonna be able to deliver. So sometimes it's not always about like coming in the the cheapest, it's about coming in like, like more in reality and just like having the best people, like trying to work with the best people who can support that, so. I think that's such a good point I because a lot of people talk about like knowing your worth and like don't sell yourself short and I think most people interpret that as financially where it's like in the example you gave like oh I could have made five thousand and I only asked for two but mm -hmm. it can also translate into like them assuming that you lack the competency to produce a certain type of shoot or a certain type of quality because you sold yourself short yeah Somebody who charges 5K likely can produce this quality amount of work. Um, and so because you aren't at that level yet, we are going to go with somebody else. And I think that's such mm -hmm. a great note to remember. Yeah. Or yeah. just like you might even be like like this other uh, photographer, you know, she is shooting at a certain level, but it's like, I think her agency, like sometimes I think when it comes to we're talking about agencies, I think it's important to work with people that align with you and people that know what they're doing because her agency, you know, she's a photographer, but her agency like shot 
you know, their whole uh, like viability to even get the project in the foot because, you know, they were underbidding so much to try to like potentially, like, I don't know exactly what they were doing, but it was just like very obvious that this is not a number that's possible. And we were able, to, we had a good relationship with the client. So we were able to find out how much they bid. And we were like, that's not even possible to do a job of this scope like on that budget so you know I think you know sometimes people you know try to like get in and then like oh well it actually is going to cost this much so it's just good to be honest about what you think something is going to cost and you know and go from there instead of trying to underbid if it's like a full scope of, of a shoot like if it's like if that has to include hair makeup studios flights hotel uh you know, um, models, uh, stylists, like all the things, like all that yeah. adds up to a number. And it's like, you have to make sure that the number that you're pitching or that you're bidding is realistic because people know, you know, most, most brands know how much these things cost. They can like, they probably have another shoot or 10 other, 20 other shoots that are the same scope and they know how much those costs. And they're like, well, this is the same scope and you're bidding, you know, a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars less than what these others cost. So you know, or whatever it is, whatever the budget yeah. is. Um, and I also love that you mentioned producer for stuff like this. Um, mm -hmm. because that's another route. Like it isn't always your agency. Like you don't have to be signed to get on productions like this. How did you determine or learn when to get a, a producer versus? I don't know if you ever were with an agency, but versus mm -hmm. being represented um I haven't been represented uh yet maybe one day I will be but um you know but it's at a certain point you can't do everything on your own and when you're doing bids like I don't know how to do a bid you know I can I can bid smaller things right, but like yeah. yeah but when it comes to like a full-on production where there's just like so many different moving parts I don't want that that level of responsibility. Also, it takes like outside money. Like pr producers have like credit cards and budgets to like be able to offset those costs. They have like special bank accounts where they can get not special, but they have like a bank account where they can receive a ton of money and not have to pay taxes on it or figure out how to go through that whole tax process uh, with receiving like $50,000 is like a down payment for like expenses or whatever. So I just don't want to like have to deal with all of that stuff. And you need help. Like it's just too many, it's too many moving parts and too much, too much work. So like just finding a good producer is, um, is really important because that's somebody that's going to help be your liaison between the brand. That's um, somebody that's basically like a bit like your representative in general, like with with the brand and like, you know, they're um, making sure that everything is running smoothly. They're working with every single level of, of all of the teams. They're, you know, the ones that are reaching out to hair and makeup. Uh, they're the ones booking your flights, hotel. They're, you know, making sure that there's, you know, the set, everything on set is running smoothly. Uh, they're finding, you know, if you're looking for a studio space, if you're looking for uh, locations or whatever, they're the ones that are like a part of that process. And like, you know, uh, and, or maybe the ones that are finding it if you don't have a location manager or something like that. So they just do a lot of work. And if you want to be the one that's concentrating on uh, the creative, you're going to want to find a producer. And also like most big brands, they, unless you actually have a production arm of your studio, which some big photographers like Annie probably, or like, you know, uh, who else? I don't know. There's like big photographer, bigger, bigger than me, much bigger than me. Photographers, they have a production arm of their studio. So they produce in-house so they can do that. But like, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't have a production arm of whatever it is that I'm doing. Uh, and, you know, yeah, you can do that. But like most brands are not going to want you to do that. You know, they want, like a producer and like even some brands like Apple um, and Amazon, I think Apple and Amazon, you, uh, they only work with certain producers. So mm -hmm. uh, actually maybe it's Apple only. I think they only work with certain producers. So you, you know, you can't, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to produce it. Like they, they only work with like approved producers that have gone through their whole system. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. 
Um, I want to transition into this editing portion because I want to know everything about your editing process and what it looks like. And if you could use some of your own images to show us that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm going to give you the opportunity to share your screen so everyone can see. And you guys can keep dropping questions in the chat, um, talking about Dana's editing process so we can get all the information we need. Okay. Um, let me see. So I'm gonna share screen. Um, oh my God, there's so many amazing questions in their chat already. You can yeah. ask while I'm doing this. Uh, but I'll I'll explain this image first, I guess. Uh, so this is one of the images that I shot when I was in Paris uh, last year, uh, and I started doing uh, started testing with this like multi exposure process. So this is one image. It's all the everything is in camera, uh, so it's not uh, it's not anything that I've done. Oh, sorry. Whoops. Hold on. Wait, are you only seeing the Photoshop? Or did you see that other thing? No, just the Photoshop. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I uh, this is cleaned up mainly <laughs> through how I color edited this. But like, I originally I had this in black and white, but I might just try and see how this looks and call it but I usually just start out um going down here to this little uh tool belt and exposure is one of my favorite uh things to use uh and I use gamma to kind of deepen the tones mm. I don't know why this is mm. uh, let me empty some trash I don't know what's going on now but uh, did that? No, I didn't go down. Gosh. So I yeah, it is looking a little glitchy on my end. Okay, so I just deepen the tones here. So I'm gonna. That's gonna be my baseline. So I'm gonna save that. And then mm -hmm. oh wait, I gotta flatten this first. It's a little lighter flattened. Could you tell us why you flatten your image? Uh because I'm gonna take it. Oh no. I don't know if you can hear me, Dana, but you froze. Get over to Lightroom. Can you hear me? Um, only a little bit. Like it, I don't know, it did some funny thing where it pitched your voice and then you spoke very rapidly. I think oh. maybe using a lot of uh RAM or something probably oh. it's glitchy. Yeah, let me try to close some things. Okay. Yes. And while Dana is doing that, I just want to remind y'all that y'all can take screenshots yeah. of yeah. our sessions today and talk about your experience and how you're liking these conversations. Because if you use the hashtag BWP Summit, that enters you for a chance to win our giveaway with Adobe Lightroom. Uh, we're giving away one free year of the photography plan, which includes Photoshop and Lightroom, the two programs Dana is using right now. Um, and so, yeah, we're choosing people at random. So please share about your experience and how you're loving these conversations. Um, and I'm, so, um, I'm gonna check in with Dana to see how we're doing. Okay, so I'm closing 
everything except Zoom? You know, it gets like that. These computers, for all the software that we have. Some of these. Huh? So for all the software that we have to use, these computers really be taking a little beating. I know. And I feel like I cle cleared this one out like not too long ago. So I don't know why it's been this way. Uh, Sometimes okay. it goes more smoothly when you turn it goes more smoothly. Uh, Brittany also dropped that note in the chat. So thank you for that, Brittany. What was the note? Uh, that sometimes it goes more smoothly if you turn your camera off. You can okay. see it. Yeah, let me turn my camera off. We're going to miss your face, but hopefully we'll be able to see your editing style. Okay. So I'm just going to stick to Lightroom and just see if that helps. Okay. Instead of having to open at the same time, having a Lightroom and, okay. But do you wanna ask a question while these are, uh, while this is doing what it's doing? Okay, yeah. Um, you know what, Mona in the chat said, is there a reason you edit in TIFF format as opposed to PSD? Uh, that was already a TIFF because I had cleaned it. Uh, wait, I had cleaned that one up, and I do I do uh save some that are PSDs if I'm trying to remember like, like what I did in terms of like layers. But I also toggle back and forth between Lightroom and Photoshop. Maybe somebody can answer this question for me because I thought that if you put a PSD in Lightroom, it doesn't save the layers, but maybe it does. So maybe somebody knows the answer to that question. But mm -hmm. but that's why I usually tip it out because mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, you just I I think it doesn't save the layers, and I I with my my editing process, I toggle back and forth constantly between um between uh, Lightroom and uh, and Photoshop. Mm, okay, yeah, I'm not sure either. I typically start off in Lightroom and then take it to Photoshop, um, and I do the same thing also where I have uh either like a tiff or a jpeg file and then i keep a psd file to see how i got to where i was going um, oh, i got to anybody in the chat? uh yeah i start off in, uh i start off in photoshop because i clean up the skin and i clean up the image first mm -hmm. so i have like a fully clean slate and then i We'll go to Lightroom because I feel like if you uh, or if I uh, start off in Lightroom, that's kind of like like maybe if I'm just playing around with the image to see what's possible. But I'll always like start the, the whole the, the very beginning of like the cleanup process in Photoshop. So because like if you have more crunch or you have contract, it gets harder to like remove uh imperfections or like you know uh like here I have like a bunch of dust from my camera like it's just hard to get that stuff out or harder to get different shadows out that are maybe like not good so that's how I start but I'm just gonna play around with this and see what's possible in here but um but I've already huh I said yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah uh, but yeah, I actually originally did this image in black and white. Uh, so I just did a little contrast and a little exposure to kind of brighten up. And with this, it's kind of cool because there was a lot of ambient light that was in the room, which kind of translated to this kind of orangey color. So when I brighten it up, you kind of see the, the oranginess a bit more. Um, I add a bit of clarity, but that's maybe too much because uh, it looks a little me. And then behaves. 
Which speaking of that, how you said like, you know, there are certain things, you know, there are certain things your process to go to Photoshop first. Um, what do you think photographers should focus on getting right in the actual shoot to improve their editing process and figure out their own workflow? Mm -hmm. Well, this one I will tell you, I did not make sure that my uh uh lens was clean, like the, the desk. There was a, bu a bunch of dust inside my camera and I didn't check that. And so these have been like really annoying for me to uh, clean up because you can see all these desks, you know, that are on the, uh, like here, 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 you know, now that I've brightened the image a bit more, you can just, you can see them more easily. But this was like, this is actually cleaned up more. This is a early version, early iteration of this image. Um, and it's just very tedious, you know, I to have to clean up all these like little dots and spots and it's really annoying. So just make sure that you are, you know, uh, as they say, like on films, like check the gate, check, you know, check and make sure that you're, uh, you know, uh, everything that you're shooting is looks clean, like when you're uh, uh, doing your tests, just, you know, make sure that the image, there's no spots and speckles, make sure that you're lens is clean, that you don't have anything on your lens, that you're spraying some air into your camera, make sure that there's no dust inside. Um, yeah, that was one thing I uh, found to be very annoying with these images, but I'm not gonna do a full deep dive because it took me like, to clean up this image, to get it to where I wanted it to be. Uh, I don't know, maybe it took me a day or two, a couple of days, maybe more. Uh, yeah. cause also this is one of the first images that I took. So I just didn't really have a workflow to figure out how these are supposed to look, but, um, yeah. And then I might add a little vignette to kind of like, I don't know if I did that before, but I think I did to kind of darken up some of these outline guys and shadows. And yeah. this is a very like, baseline and I'll, I'll show you the final image because that just I spent like probably yeah a day or two working on that image and sometimes like I'll spend like over the course of like weeks or months working on images so like um when I shot my magazine Scruggs magazine uh those images I worked on for like two years, the, the images that I shot of Adonis Basso, uh, those kind of, you know, were, you know, I didn't really have a workflow for those or I didn't really understand like how to make those look good. So it was just like, just messing with them and like being dissatisfied. And I, I'll do like, you know, 10, 20, 30 versions of an image, like until it's right. So like, <laughs> I, I think don't be afraid, just like, you know, tweak an image to death uh, or walk away from it for a week or two or a couple months and uh, and then come back to it with fresh eyes. But uh, I'm doing the blacks right now. The kind of- Yeah, I always say like fresh eyes are so important and um, especially with personal work too, where it's like sometimes you do end up with all these different versions and I think you just do it by playing around with these features. There's like yeah. certain things you know you want to do sometimes, but the rest of it is play to figure out what you like. Yeah. Um, but I also want to call out because Adobe is here with us and they let us know in the chat that for the PSD files in Lightroom, you'll find the option in the Photoshop file handling preferences. Lightroom imports and saves PSD files with a bit depth of eight bits or 16 bits per channel. And to work with 32 bit images in Lightroom, you just save your file as a TIFF or a PSD. So thank you so much for that and that clarification. Awesome. Can you see my whole screen? Can you see this folder up or are you just saying Lightroom? No, just Lightroom. Okay, so uh, I wanna move on to the next image. This is kind of like where I ended up. I did a little clarity, a little dehaze, a little vignette to kind of bring in the guys in the corner uh, to kind of uh, darken them up a bit to make them more shadow-like, added some contrast, a little brightness to our exposure to brighten them up. And 
and a bright in the sky up in the middle with the highlights and then also use shadows and blacks to try to bring those guys in. This is like a more nuanced image. Like I did a lot of work to, to like by hand to get this image to look more, uh, not like this. So, uh, you know, I'll I'll show you what this image looks, looks like uh, at the uh, final version of the image. Um, yeah, while you bring up your next image, I have a question from Sandia. Um, and it says, are you able to elaborate okay. on the ways you direct your subjects for portraits to create evocative images um, and avoid stiff photos? And it says, are you able to elaborate on the ways you direct your subjects for portraits to create? What was the question? Sorry, I kind of heard some feedback there. Um, so yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, they asked, can you elaborate on the ways you direct your subjects for portraits to create more evocative images and avoid stiff photos, especially when you're low on time, like you were for the Tonys? Right. Um, I just, you know, I come up with different, like, uh, I guess exercises to, um, to get people to do stuff. So like I might tell somebody to pretend like there are pieces of spaghetti that were just thrown against the wall and what would their body <laughs> look like if they were a piece of spaghetti and it was like, if it's sliding down the wall. Uh, so that's one thing, but you can kind of come up with any random thing. Like I just think a random thing is a good starting off point, but then I also see what kind of weird direction would help them open up or close or, or contort their body in a way that would be uh, stronger. Um, so yeah, like one example, many years ago, I shot uh, a model in, uh, uh, where actually, it doesn't matter. I tell very long stories. It doesn't matter where he was, but long story short, I told him to pretend like he was an astronaut. So he would have more lightness in his body. And then I told him to pretend like he was an astronaut doing Tai Chi. So he would open up his 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 limbs and his arms more widely and slowly. And then told him to pretend like he was an astronaut doing Tai Chi while getting chased by Godzilla. So that was giving him like more emotiveness on his face and maybe even more like hyperextension in his body if you're like running, but he's also doing it slowly. So, you know, it's just like a lot of random things that I just come up with and I have certain go-tos, but like, uh, or I just like tell people to breathe, close their eyes. I breathe with them. And then when that moment is right, just open their eyes. So it's just like less tension. I like to like loosen the hips. I'll loosen their, my hips with them, shake the shoulders out. Like it can be very relaxing. It depends on what it is. So like sometimes it's more relaxing. Sometimes they're doing more stuff. But this is the final version of that image. So um, I don't know how to do, oh wait, I can't do can I do double? Uh, I don't know where the other one is. Uh, I have to go. So basically, I did a lot of this by hand in, in uh, Photoshop. So I uh, used probably the overlay tool uh, and maybe something else to like darken him up all the way from like his chest. Cause if you look at the uh, original image, which was this, it was, you know, this whole part of him was like light. They were like more ghosty light because of, you know, where the light was and all that. And then now it's just more dynamic. And like, you know, the only light part in the image is his eye, which I just thought, you know, so I probably spent I don't even know how, I, I feel like these images have just been like, I've been tweaking them for the past couple of years or no, not past, like I shot this last year, but the past year or so, but this one I, I finished pretty quickly. So maybe I, it took me a couple of days to kind of figure out what I was doing with this. But, um, but yeah, I just really like it. And I brightened this, this guy up in his eye a little bit, just so you can see that, that eye a bit more um, here. But if you go from here to here, it's a lot of work. So sometimes, you know, I don't like an image to look worked on, you know, that's like the, that's where you have to like find that balance of like it looking worked on and looking over retouched and like fine tuning something 
you know, in a drastic way, which I think this is a pretty drastic, you know, transformation, but, but just doing it in a way with a light hand and just building. So that's how like, I'll end up with 30 versions of an image because I'm just like building and tweaking and starting over. Sometimes like I'll do an image and I'm like, I've spent like days or weeks on this image, but I have to start over because I missed the step or I figured out how to fix something and just, you know, but yeah. yeah. So Okay. I, I love how this one came out too. Um, I think the series was super beautiful. Thank um, you. Yeah. While you're like picking up your next photo, um, we have an anonymous question that says, when choosing to shoot film for campaigns or jobs, do you plan a test shoot or pre-light day ahead of time to ensure that the lighting camera and film come out the way that you want? Um, If there's budget. So like, uh, You know, a lot of times, uh, most times, I'm looking for an image. Actually, I love this. Wow. Uh, you know. This is another one from that series, but it's it it it's more cleaned up now because yeah. there's like a, a bunch of shadows on his face and like a bunch of overlapping things that are happening. But nobody's seen this image yet. So you guys are the first to see this image. But um, let me see. This is also a favorite image of mine that I just, uh, was from the shoot in Paris with Madame Figaro. Uh, and they turned out really well. These aren't the final where they ended up, but the tones were a lot deeper. Uh, yeah. And there was less grain on the finals. There's a lot of grain on this one. But I'm trying to find that... Uh, Eddie Redmayne image is not letting me put it back in here. Those two were just so crazy. <laughs> like, what were the questions for those? Uh, that well, they're dancers. So they are, uh, uh, let me just see if this is gonna let me do something else. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're already dancers. So I shot this, uh, editorial with Madame Figaro in Paris. Um, dang it, dang it. Last year. And uh, and it was all like Parisian dancers. Um, so they were all different like uh, sensibilities or uh, uh, different like mediums. So like this guy was like, a crumper, not that, not this guy. Uh, this guy was like a crumper, mm. and he, uh, you know, just like I don't know if you remember that movie Rise from like the nineties. It was a documentary. I so it's kind of, huh? I said I was there, present, absolutely. Yeah, so it was kind of interesting to like see how far that movement has come from like L.A., from like you know South Central and Compton and all those places to you know now uh it's global you know and that's like the culture going that far so um so yeah but uh but he was a crumper there was like another girl who was in ballet there was another girl who was uh american uh and she uh uh works at the the uh the crazy horse which is a really famous like burlesque club in uh in uh in paris and uh, so, yeah, everybody was like doing different, uh, you know, uh, had different mediums. Yeah. And and I have an image from that shoot that if we have time, I'll work on. But uh, I'm just trying to get this one image in because I have to put it into, I have to change it a little bit. Oh, wait. Okay. Okay. I don't even know. It's just not letting me upload it because it's already in there, but I couldn't find it to edit it. So I had to like do a little bit of a change on it. Okay, here we go. <sighs> so um, this is a photo I did of Eddie Redmayne, uh, who is one of my favorite actors. And so it's kind of cool to be able to photograph him for uh, the New York Times. And um, 
he uh we shot this in the new york times studio also and uh this was on film and i use well i actually use black and white film for this one which if you can it's great but i i do also use mainly color film but uh but when you do shoot with black and white film it does come out a little bit just like more tonal mm -hmm. but um with this you don't really have to do a lot because the light was perfect you know uh the exposure was like right on point and um, I just like to, like with my black and whites, I like them to be more, to be deeper and richer. So, you know, I know some people like, you know, have it a bit blown out. Like that's just not my style. With black and white, they have the skin very blown out, very white, depending on like, it doesn't even matter if it's a, a you know, if the person has a darker skin tone or a lighter skin tone. Some people just like prefer to have like a more like white skin tone on people with black and white. Uh, that's just not really my thing, but um, but yeah, I really like the skin to pop too. Like you know, he has a lot of freckles, so you know, yeah. just highlighting those. But also, like when it comes to freckles, sometimes you know they can get overwhelming on a face and really pull focus. So just kind of like cleaning those shadows of you know um, of those freckles up a bit, just so that they are like less pulling focus in one spot sometimes like one spot with the freckles will just like pull all your focus um and what we're doing okay so i'm just adding more shadow and just deepening that even more so that you know it's just like the focus like it's just pulling more focus to the center of his face and just like all of this is like more in shadow uh but you don't really have to do a lot with this one i just think it's a really nice portrait and i like to make portraits that aren't necessarily like super uh basic I just add a little bit of clarity not too much I think sometimes like clar clarity is good because I think like having a bit of sharpness is for me I, I like that but when it's over sharp it looks crunchy so um and it just doesn't look good so I like to make sure that there's like a bit of clarity on there and it really helps with when you add more clarity because the eye pops the eye is crisper but um but yeah, this is just a really nice portrait and I feel like it's less uh, expected. It's like, it's not like super like out there, but it's just like less like, okay, I'm just staring in the camera and I'm present. There's just like a little bit of like, almost like a gazing off, like he's not even really looking almost directly in the camera and just yeah. like a relaxed, relaxed thing happening. Like, just like he's like leaning forward and there's just like, this in itself is almost like, you know, just his hands mm -hmm. or like its own like kind of abstraction and adding this like, I don't know, softness, but like abstraction to the image. And then you just have the eye uh, and just like a little touch to the lips. Like sometimes you don't even realize like when you're, you know, shooting stuff, like how little adjustments, like if his, if his hand was like a little bit away from his mouth, it would have looked less comfortable. It would have looked more posed. This feels like it is a pose, but it doesn't feel like, like yes. I'm posing. Yeah. So having everything touching, like I try to like watch out for those things is like having everything touching, having everything like, um, I don't know, fully realized. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but just like watch and see what looks awkward and weird, you know? So that's like one of the important things. And then the final of this one, I ended up cropping it. Uh, While you're pulling up the final, I just want to say I'm so glad to see you using the dehaze. I feel like some people would be sleep on the dehaze or like take dehazing a little too far and it also becomes a little crunchy or like too soft. But especially for black and whites, I think it made your image look so beautiful. And how you were saying like, it made your image look so beautiful. And how you were saying What did you say? Like how you were saying you were really focusing on his features when you were playing with the shadows where it's like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, like use these editing tools to your benefit and to the subject's benefit. Like he has freckles. We can play into that without being distracted to the image. And yeah. that looked so beautiful. Like I love this final image. Thank you. And I really didn't want it to be too bright. So like I, this, this version is, or this one is like, I actually took, the brightness down and I took the highlights down 
And uh, now that I'm looking at the final, uh, I really wanted it to feel like more subtle and softer. And I think sometimes like when we go black and white, people feel like they have to brighten it. And actually like I under, uh, under exposed it uh, quite, not quite a bit, but a bit. And I added a bit of sepia because I just wanted it to warm up the image. It was a bit colder. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, and then when I underexposed it, you know, it really, you know, helped to bring out, you know, his his freckles and, you know, because the brighter you are, you know, you're going to lose that detail as much. But you see how much colder the image is now. And it just, it doesn't, it kind of lost a bit of its like uh, connectedness, I think, with the coldness to it. But um, but yeah, I really love the final image. I think it just turned out really well. And it looks like a campaign, which I, you know, uh, I, th I think is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I love this. That warmth was a really good idea. Um, I would love if you could take us through another photo that maybe you have on hand. But um, I wanted, we have so many questions in this chat. So I wanted to see if we could do like a bit of a rapid fire as you're working on the next image and we can get to just as many questions as we can. Yeah. How does that mean? Uh, this is from the that shoot with the dancers that I was talking about. Uh, and this was an Avedon reference. Uh, there's a photo that, uh, that Avedon did probably in the 70s or 80s with a girl upside down. And I've seen other photographers try it. Like after I found the image, I ended up seeing a couple other photographers try it. And I just feel like it was like, okay. But I feel like what we did was like, really great and it wasn't like a, a direct it wasn't like a complete direct reference where it felt like I was trying to copy him um but I did reference him and reference this pose and I you know we did it our way and I think it turned out really well um but yeah I'm ready for a question I'm just doing some contrast you guys can see what I'm doing too like I don't have to like say it I guess but oh so I'll answer the questions and you guys just look at what I'm doing and then I'll do a recap Okay, cool. Um, so I'll start off with Danielle, who asked, how do you advise photographers to do test shoots as often as they can if they are in a city with few modeling agencies? Uh, get your family and friends. So, you know, there's plenty of people, you know, maybe not plenty if you're like in the desert or in like the forest. I don't know how far away from civilization you are. But, you know, um, I would give the example of like Kennedy Carter. She, you know, was the youngest person to shoot the cover of British Vogue. She shot Beyonce. And the, most of her work was shooting local people in North Carolina. She still lives in North Carolina. Uh, she's not shooting like models every day. She's shooting like her family. She's shooting her friends. She's shooting people in the community. So, you know, even if you're in, you know, and she's not in like a big city. So even if you're in a small town, you know, you can still find people, you know, or even yourself, you know, I've shot self portraits of myself. There's people that have entire bodies of work based on themselves. So there's just, you know, there's, there's always a way, there's always a way. So um, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, and we love Kennedy Carter over here. Um, so yeah, she's one of our faves too. Um, we have another question from Lewis that says, what was the process like getting your work to sell? And that that's one of their current struggles. Sell so how? Like um, they didn't provide context, but maybe print uh or exhibits uh, or exhibits. Um, well, you know, I'm, I think that like getting your work and, you know, putting it online is really important. Putting it on Instagram is really important. I think a lot of people, you know, sometimes I feel like now people are more hesitant about Instagram because of, you know, they're like, oh, well, they'll own it or some, some more weird loophole, whatever. I don't think that like, 99% of the people on Instagram have to worry about. I don't know, maybe Instagram might one day decide to like pull some people's photos and like do something with them. I have no idea, but I wouldn't use that as an excuse to not post because 
like all the people that are hiring are on Instagram. They're all, you know, all the ones that are looking for people are on, on Instagram. So, you know, you kind of have to, um, to, to put your work out there. Every opportunity that I've gotten has got, has come from me putting my work on the internet. And, um, when it comes to, uh, the art world, you know, that's a tougher nut, nut, nut to crack. Um, I'm, I'm working on that right now, <laughs> but, uh, but I've just had, you know, luckily I've just had, you know, um, institutions reach out to me to, uh, either acquire my work, uh, or exhibit my work. Uh, I had, I was a part of, um, it's an ongoing show with Photographiska, uh, called Nude. I have some of my early work, uh, shooting Rose, Traore, um, I shot him in Mexico on a beach. Uh, those images uh, have been running around the world for a couple of years with Photographiska. Um, my self-portrait was acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, which is an incredible institution and like one of the most amazing museums I've ever been to. It's like a campus really. Um, and uh, they exhibited that last year. And, uh, and I went down to see it and it was just so crazy because usually like if I think the wall, it's other people, but you know, this time it was actually me that was on the wall and it was like the first piece of work that you saw when you walked in. So it was like when you're walking in, the first thing you're seeing is, is me uh, on my couch in my living room in Brooklyn uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so yeah, that was really cool. Um, and then like that, do you, did that come from them already being aware of your work and your presence? Or is that again, you like pitching yourself, maybe even in the past and they coming back and being like, oh, we want to acquire this piece from you. Right. Actually, uh, a, um, uh, I shot that for the New York Times in the pandemic and um, an editor at the Times actually sent my work to them. Uh, and that's how I got it. So, oh. uh, so really grateful for that opportunity. Um, and then the other thing I have, I mean, I was in Swiss Beats. Um, he, he used to have a show called No Commission where all the artists didn't have to pay a commission. They just get their work you know, seen by like really big celebrities, art collectors, uh, whoever, uh, in shows that he was hosting across the world. And uh, and I was in No Commission Miami one year. And that also gave me more exposure. Uh, and it was cool because my, uh, I had two images in that show and one of the images sold out, like I sold all of the editions. So when you're selling prints, make sure you're doing limited editions uh for the most part like if you're doing an open commit open edition sale like go for it but for the most part you should be limiting your editions to like seven or more like or seven or ten maybe that ten is a lot but it's like the scarcity factor so if you're selling you know 30 or 40 or 50 of a print there's the value is less because there's more if you yeah. have less then you, you know, as you start to sell through your editions, which is, you know, seven prints. So if I sold one print, I'm just going to give arbitrary numbers. I'm not going to give real numbers, but if I sell my first of seven prints, I sell that one for, let's say a hundred dollars. Um, then the second one, I can up the price. Maybe I sell that one for $400. Then for the next one up and up and up. So the last one, that's the last one. So for like, that's the last one for my lifetime. You know, I'm not going to reprint those. I'm not going to sell any more. So if somebody wants that, they're going to have to pay whatever number I set if they want it. So I maybe I want to say that's $2,000 or $50,000 or whatever it is that you're at. And then, you know, you also want to keep two artist prints, so two APs. So if you have, those are like your own prints. They don't have to be printed already, but they're just like extras. And like, if you wanted to print them for yourself, essentially. And, you know, somebody comes and like, they want that print. It's like, well, it's sold out, but I do have an artist print left. Right. You know, then, you know, you can just name your price. If they want to sell, if they want to buy it, they can buy it. Maybe that one you want to sell for, 
$5,000 or $200,000 or whatever. You can just name your own price. If they want to buy it, they can buy it. If not, you know, they don't have to, but it's like, there's only one or two left in for the, for my entire life of this image. So if you want it, this is the price. So um, I definitely want to like, like go deeper into the art world, which I'm hoping I, you know, will be able to do with this uh, new body of work with the the multi-exposure stuff. Um, but yeah, but I've definitely like had, you know, forays into it, but there's people that are definitely more tapped into that. So, so yeah, but this is just like a quick, a quick color edit, just deepening of the tones. I love dehaze. That's one of my favorites. Also the, um, the the gamma tool on Photoshop, that's something I also use. So even like at this point with dehaze, it's not like dehaze enough. So I will transfer it to Photoshop and add more gamma to even though those shadows and films. But the final image ended up looking like, wait. Ended up looking like this. So pretty, oh wait, no, that's not it. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, yeah, I think it turned out well. And this was the cover, which, you know, I am really grateful. I'm trying to get it at a good, uh, but this, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, you don't, they'll choose the more, more most vanilla image for the cover. But, you know, this was for Madame Figaro, which is a, a kind of like a women's magazine in, in, in France. It's kind of like the French version of Vogue, but kind of like on a, a smaller scale. Um, yeah. But they chose this image um, and uh, for the cover, which, you know, it's a very interesting image. And I really appreciated that, that they, you know. Uh, chose this one and we did this was a 27 page spread we shot all uh, mm -hmm. yeah we shot all Dior Celine that was also like kind of a cool experience we just had you know all the designers Louis Vuitton like like all the designers and um Jenke who is a uh a famous fashion stylist um he saw Beyonce and Naomi and a bunch of people he styled it. So it was a really cool experience. And um, yeah, I thought it turned out well. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, which speaking of like this crop, Sandia asks, do you have a typical crop or aspect ratio that you use for final photos or just does it just depend on the image and composition for you? Um, it just depends on the image. You know, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a specific one. Which whatever is working, um, yeah, whatever is working really um, is what I do. <laughs> and then for Amani, um, I know you mentioned earlier that you have like some people um, that you hire for your assistant. You have like people that. And Amani wants to know: Have you ever worked as a photo assistant, and what advice you would give for taking that route? Um, you know, not really. I really haven't worked. I worked, I did one, one shoot where I assisted in a, phot a photographer, um, way long ago. And, uh, and I just couldn't get work as an assistant. Like I, it's, uh, and I'm actually glad that that happened because I really was focusing on my own work, uh, and, and developing myself for, you know, those years and developing my aesthetic. And, and, you know, being an assistant can be helpful, but sometimes also you can get stuck in the route of being an assistant. And it can be hard to transition from, you know, an assistant to photographer. And you're also really being influenced by whoever it is that you're working with the most. So sometimes it can be hard to develop your own style uh, there's some photographer, some assistants that work with, you know, really big photographers. I get to travel all over the world. It's, you know, uh, you know, they work, you know, they get, you know, a salary, you know, they're just somebody's, you know, they're, they're working full time with a certain photographer and, you know, it can be cool, you know, to have those experiences, but, you know, also a lot of times you don't have the time to, 
to work on your own stuff. So, um, so I really, you know, I'm kind of grateful that I didn't have that, you know, at the time it, it sucked because I was just really wanting that experience. I did assist at a, or I did intern at a photo studio. Uh, and that was kind of like somewhat of a learning experience. Uh, but I didn't really learn lighting. I didn't really learn how to be on set. I learned how to like quail chords and do random shit. <laughs> but like, uh, just, uh, you know, but you, but it was a networking. I also met, you know, quite a few people and, you know, some photographers that are really huge photographers I used to work with um, in, uh, at the studio. Now they're really big. So, you know, uh, and some people that, you know, they are still assisting and, you know, they were assisting back then. So like, and I know they wanted to be photographers. So it's just like, you know, everybody has their own journey. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think assisting is a, a good thing, but I think, and it's a good way to learn. But I think also you have to make sure you're making the time to work on your own work because otherwise you'll get stuck. Um, which does happen to a lot of like assistants who become career assistants and and some people do want to just be career assistants too so there's nothing wrong with that at all but I know that there a lot of assistants do want to be full, full-time photographers and it's just uh yeah you just have to like make that time so. yeah <laughs> um you talked a little bit about social media um, and I mean, part of this whole conversation has really been about putting yourself out there in different ways you've done that. And we have a, another anonymous question that I really like um, that says, how do you navigate social media as an artist? Have you ever felt compelled to share more about yourself than you are comfortable with? And have you felt pressured to have um, to be more of a content creator rather than posting what you generally care about? Um, I mean... Nobody's pressuring anybody to do anything. Um, or not necessarily pressuring anybody to do anything. I don't know. Nobody's pressuring me to do anything. I think that like social media can make you feel like you have to like say certain things about certain things. And I'm like, you know, I used to be more outspoken about like things that were bothering me or things that I saw in society. And now like I just feel like it's very um for my mental health, <laughs> you know, I just like I, I feel like I share less on social media. I'm less involved in social media now. I will post what I'm doing, but I don't feel the need to like bear my soul. I feel like I used to, you know, go really personal on posts. And I think that like, it really connected with a lot of people, but it can also be very draining. You know what I mean? And it can be like, it can also give people a sense that they know you better than they do. And I've had people share really like traumatic things with me, which is not, you know, I don't like when you're not prepared to read something like that, when you think it's just a message, you know what I mean? It can be a lot. So, you know, now I just kind of step away. And I think also people like, people will just do weird stuff. Like I've just had like a bunch of weird things happen with people on social media and and just crossing boundaries in certain ways. So I, for me, I just, I've, I've taken a step back from that. Like I, I, I get messages from people that I don't read most of my messages anymore. Um, I will post like, you know, uh, new work, uh, and I will maybe tell an anecdote every now and then, but I don't really share that much anymore. And I, I do feel like there can be a pressure to, to be, you know, I don't know, more, uh, I don't know. I feel like the pressure is either being put on ourselves, like we put a pressure on ourselves to be more open and say more stuff on social media. And I think also like there's a demand for people to like, well, you have to like, you know, have this political stance or you have to have this like say, speak out about this or that or whatever. And there's so much, and people are going through so much on so many different levels. You don't owe anybody anything. You don't owe anybody your time you don't like uh, owe anybody you know your point of view if you feel like saying something about something if you feel like talking about your personal life if you feel like you know doing whatever do that but if you don't feel like it you know don't pressure yourself and don't like feel pressured if somebody or like people are saying you should say whatever like I feel like you know that's kind of the toxicity of social media right now which is why I have you know taken a step back from it yeah, that's really important. Um, which I feel like even in a way kind of speaks to 
Like that's that's why I feel. I feel like you're only one person. You can only do so much. Yeah. You only have one life. You have to protect yourself. Period. You know. So that's that's how I feel about that. Yeah, and also, I mean, we're black women photographers here, and we take on so much already. Just being a woman in, in this world. Mm -hmm. um, as you spoke to like people crossing boundaries and things, I think it's important to just like do what feels right to you in that moment. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to answer every message. You don't have to like, you know, like, you know, people used to reach out to me to um, to meet and I used to do it back in the day. I don't have the bandwidth anymore to do it. Like it's just yeah. too much. And it's, um, you know, I just, I try to take care of myself. You know, I have a lot going on. You know, we all have families. We all have issues. You know what I mean? Like you're always seeing the like highlights of people's lives. So like, you know, it can feel like, oh, well, this person's doing more or this person is, you know, having a better life than me for whatever reasons or insecurities that you might have with yourself. So that's why I think social media right now is just like, like, it's just not like, like I get inspiration from it, but I do find it to be quite toxic. So yeah, yeah, that's so fair. Yeah, but I this image actually took in Paris many years ago, and uh, I was had just gotten my first uh, or my Sony camera. My, I shoot with a Sony. My personal camera is a Sony A seven R three. And I just didn't really know how to like navigate it. So if you looked at the image at the beginning, it was just very dark because I just didn't know how to properly expose that at that time. <laughs> and I was just doing whatever. But I really love this image because it's just like very abstract and weird. And we just shot this on a street in uh, Montmartre. And uh, if you're familiar with Paris. And uh, in the final image, I actually uh, removed this thing right here. And I kind of cleaned it up. Do I have a, did I get the uh, other version of the cleaned up version of this? I don't know if I did get the cleaned up version of this, but it's a cool image, long story short. Uh, and uh, the final looks a lot nicer and cleaner than this, but this is, uh, I just like it because I just love his foot. I love the, how the foot is laying. I love the headlessness uh like abstraction is what really I really enjoy uh yeah, it seems like you've always been attracted to like shape and form in that way I love it yeah so. um I want to get to Tricia or maybe Trisha's question in the chat we were talking uh earlier in the conversation about how you began reaching out to clients uh but they also want to know how long did it take to for you to start getting work um, you know, it took six and a half years for me to get my big break. So, you know, a lot of times people, uh, let me put my, my video on. Oh, God. Hey, you are. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> um, I think a lot of times people will think like, you know, they'll see like with social media, you know, you see like somebody that's like either really young or somebody, you know, that you feel like they haven't been shooting that long or whatever. And you're like, damn, like, why am I not getting jobs? Like, why am I not, you know, moving forward? Why am I not, you know, uh, you know, yeah, and, and it just, why am I not just a question at all? You know, why am I not? But uh, it can be tough, but I think that you have to be consistent. You know, I think that like, you have to, even when there's no one that's cheering you on, or maybe it's just your parents or your family or whoever, um, you have to be your own cheer cheerleader and you have to like be willing to make work in a bubble. You know, I feel like I was making work in a bubble for like over six years and I, you know, really didn't have, uh, like I wasn't assisting. I was just like, you know, shooting constantly and, and just developing my work in my own style and not really getting a ton of feedback from people like beyond social media or like Tumblr sometimes, you know, back in the day. But um I uh it was it was disheartening at a lot of times because I felt like oh if I shot this way then I'll be making more money I would you know if I shot this or making money at all period um but you know if I and I for a while I did try to shoot in a, a different way that was like more commercial yeah that 
I saw other people that were being more successful shooting it, but I just didn't like it. You know, I was like, this is garbage. And, you know, cause it's not me. And it, it comes across as garbage because you're trying to do something that's not you. So um, I would just suggest, you know, just keep hanging in there, you know, keep working, you know, don't expect anything to happen overnight. Uh, don't expect that anybody owes you anything. That's one of the biggest lessons I think any of us can can take is that, you know, yeah, like no one owes you anything. I feel like I have worked really hard to get where I am, but it didn't happen overnight. And I didn't feel beholden to to anyone or anything like, oh, like I deserve, which I did deserve, but it wasn't like I'm entitled to this. You know what I mean? I think that when you start to feel entitled to things, you become bitter because mm -hmm. you, you know I'm entitled to have this happen to me. I'm entitled to this uh, to this uh, opportunity or whatever. And it's like if it's for you, it's for you. That's that's one of the mentalities that I've had. If it's for me, it's going to happen for me. If it's not, it's not meant for me, and it's meant for somebody else and good for them. You know, like I have to keep working on myself. You know. Uh, and working on like where I'm going. And, and if people recognize that, great. If they don't, I can't do anything about that, you know, so. I love the call out to the line of deserving between deserving and entitlement. Like, I feel like that's such a good framework to keep in mind where it's like when you are adjusting your own feelings in the state that you're in, I am going for something because I know I deserve my success in X, Y, Z but I don't have to claim entitlement to people's time, resources, like anything. I can achieve something for my own talent. Exactly. And that's why I think with, you know, with the outreach and reaching out to people, sometimes people feel entitled to other people's time. So it's like, well, you didn't get back to me. So, you know, I'm mad at you or like, I'm not going to respond or whatever. I've had people like, you know, email me like, you know, like, well, I guess you don't want to work with me. So I'm not going to reach out to you anymore. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, come on. Like, you know, the people in this industry are so busy. Like, you know, I could have booked like literally my first big break was shooting, the, was shooting uh, for ESPN's The Body Issue. And the photo editor, the photo director of ESPN, she, I asked her, how did you find me? And she was like, oh, I just saw you on Instagram. I don't know when I just bookmarked you. And I thought you would be good for the uh, issue. So I don't even know like when she, you know what I mean? Uh, it could have been a year or two before, like with the guy that, you know, for a year, he was, I was still in his mind, like in the back, all the way in the back. But, you know, me constantly, not constantly, but every now and then, you know, reminding him kept slowly bringing me to the front. So if you come into this industry feeling entitled to people's time, to jobs, to whatever, you're going to end up so bitter and you're going to end up so angry all the time uh, because, you know, people, if, if it's like I said, if it's for you, it's for you. People will give you an opportunity if they want to. If they don't want to, that's OK, too. But. Um, but you shouldn't feel like get angry if somebody doesn't respond to you. You shouldn't, you know, like you should try not to feel like rejection, even though it is a form of rejection uh, if, if people don't respond. But you can't meet that rejection with anger and yeah. um, and, and entitlement because then people are not going to want to like, like if you like that person responded back to me and was like, well, you know, I emailed you and like I'm, I just wanted to try to work with you. You know what I mean? It's just like. It's, it's like, I'm not going to want to work with you at all. Like, you're, you're actually not helping yourself. Right. You should have just followed up. Just like, hey, how are you? You know, like, just, you know, here's some new work. You know, I hope you're doing well. Blah, 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 and just moved on. You know what I mean? So. Um, I wanted, to, like, we're coming closing to the time. Um, but I thought this was a really beautiful question. I would love if we could end on this. Um, yeah. Um, anonymous and they just said what campaign or project are you most proud of oh, I don't know if y'all heard that I've been sitting here so, like my body is tight but um what am I the most proud of I mean one of the most one of the things I'm most proud of because I feel like it was a manifestation moment um 
And I think a lot of the, a lot of the, my life I have manifested, uh, you know, through thought, through positive thinking and just through repetition thinking, you know what I mean? Like, so like, like I went back way back, you know, when I was just working at a nail salon and like working at Whole Foods, I work at Whole Foods, I work at the nail salon, managing a nail salon in the, in the daytime. And then I will like work as a cashier at Whole Foods. Uh, uh, in the evening, uh, and I would tell people, you know, I'm going to shoot for Nike one day. I'm going to shoot for Nike one day. And, um, and that, and I would, and people ask me, oh, did you shoot for Nike yet? And I'm like, no, I haven't shot for Nike yet, but I'm, I'm going to, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to Amsterdam. I'm going to Amsterdam one day or whatever. And they're like, oh, you go, you still going to Amsterdam? I'm like, yeah, I am, but I haven't gone yet. But, you know, so like, I feel like sometimes we're afraid to tell people what we want because they're like, oh, if it doesn't happen, then they're gonna be like, well, I thought you said you want to answer them. I thought you said we want right. uh, to shoot for Nike. And I feel like that repetitious thought and me also telling people the things that I wanted to do manifested the things that I wanted to happen. So I did end up going to Amsterdam and like, uh, like I almost moved there. I thought about moving there because like they support artists there. And at the time it was just really difficult for me here. So I was like, you know, let me try to figure out a way to go there. And then I ended up shooting for Nike which was my first big campaign. And it was a massive campaign, uh, you know, just like bigger than, like, I just, like, I had no learning curve. Like it just went from zero to like a thousand. And then um, a lot of things I've just said, you know, people that I said that I've wanted to shoot, you know, at a certain point, I would just think about them because I feel like I had built up this energy of manifestation that I would just think about them. And the next day I would get an email asking me to photograph them. And um, I guess the biggest, one of the most recent ones that happened with that is me shooting Eddie Redmayne, which is a photo that I um, showed uh, because I, when I first moved to New York, I was working at a photo studio. And at the time, if you follow me on Instagram, you might already know this story. But at the time I was literally uh, like a grunt. So one day I was like setting up the studio in the morning, I was setting up the penthouse. And I was just like, you know, putting, you know, all the gear in or whatever. And, um, uh, and I was like, oh, like, I never, I was never in the studio for shoots. So it just kind of like, it's like, oh, like, it would be nice to like be here during a shoot or whatever. So then later that day, I was like with a rag and a bucket, like scrubbing some radiator slats, like these radiators, like went all around the entire studio. And I was just like scrubbing them with a rag and a bucket. That's like literally just grunt work. And then somebody called down and they're like, oh, can you go up to the, to the, uh, to the penthouse and take the trash out of the, you know, the shoot that's going on there. And I was happy to do it because I, you know, was scrubbing radiators. <laughs> so I went up there and I pulled, you know, uh, the garbage out of the, the trash can and turned around and it's Eddie Redmayne and he's getting shot for GQ. And um, I was like, wow, like he's such an incredible move. He moves so well. Like he's like moving, jumping. He's like just, you know, the embodiment of like what I'm looking for when I'm photographing somebody is just like abstraction, just like uh, uh, interpretation, just like just doing, you know, he's like not thinking. Like I always tell people, don't think about it. Just, you know, just do it. Just like let your body just do it. And so um, and I said to myself, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to photograph him one day. And he's been like on my list for, you know, since that time. And then um, I ended up getting the opportunity to shoot him for the New York Times twice in like less than a month. Uh, I shot him, you know, uh, huh? twice, come on. Yeah, twice. So <laughs> I just, you know, I shot him for, you know, uh, he's in Cabaret on Broadway now. And I shot him and Joel Gray, who originated the role of uh, that the Eddie is playing on, on Broadway uh, in Cabaret. And then I ended up getting the opportunity to shoot all the Tony nominees, and he was nominated for a Tony uh, a couple weeks later. And you know, so yeah, so that's kind of like a manifestation thing. That was a lot. That was like a longer, longer game manifestation. But he had been on my list. Like I write down the people that I want to shoot, and I've been able to cross some people off the list. And he was definitely like at the top. So um, that is so beautiful. Manis manifestation is so real. Um, and I'm, that just always excites me when I see 
things play out like this or hear the stories of like Crazy something life. Thing actually coming to life. And yeah. um, just wanted to call out this comment because it's so sweet from Sandia. And it says, this was the best photo event I've ever attended. Thank you, Dana, for your wisdom, attention, and time. And Chrissy for the amazing moderation and questions. So much to Great. take so much to take so much inspiration and I'm just like oh my god this is so beautiful and I feel super proud and I'm so happy you were able to talk to us thank you so much Dana yeah no problem thank you for having me um I really appreciate it and you know I had a good time uh and, and I'm like now I'm looking at the questions because I uh wasn't looking at anything right I mean, maybe I can't see the questions no I can't see the question but anywho uh, but thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I was just, you know, happy to to give people insight and, you know, hopefully uh, it will be helpful. Yeah, I think it was helpful based on all these questions. And there were so many more that we couldn't get to. Like this was two hours. And while this was a lot and you took us through so much, there was still so much to go through. I mean, this is a lifetime of work and excellence. So I'm really grateful that you committed this amount of time. Uh, for us. And before going, though, I just want to call out, we have a free seven day trial for Lightroom. So if you don't already use Lightroom, and you'd like to learn it and give it a try, we have a link in the chat that you can go to right now to get your free seven day trial. Along with that, we have our giveaway that I mentioned earlier, where if you use the hashtag BWP Summit and, you know, tag BWP and Adobe and let us know what you're thinking about these talks and how you're liking the event, um, you'll be entered to win in this giveaway. And in the giveaway, you'll win one uh, free year of the photography plan at Adobe. Photography um, plan at Adobe. Um, so yeah, thank you again. We have so many more surprises coming up and we'll be back in about an hour for our next guest. Oh, oh, before we leave, do you mind if I take a screenshot? Do you mind if I take a screenshot? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Okay. Yay. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Dana. I'm so, so grateful. It was so much fun. Um, We'll see you again next time. Actually smiling because I feel like I didn't know it was coming. Like, oh, did you have something? We could do another one. Do another one. Okay, because I I wasn't. I thought everybody was in a pop up. But, oh, no. So that's. <laughs> so I'll smile. I'll smile. I don't know if you got me smiling or not. If you got me smiling, then I'm fine. Okay, let's do another one. Okay. Just sure. Okay. Perfecto. Thank you. All right, perfect. Um, oh, and I just also want to mention, oh, mention we'll be hosting another Q and A series very soon for the twenty twenty four Lightroom Ambassadors. We'll be learning all about their creative journeys as well, so stay tuned for that. Um, but yes, we'll see you guys soon in about an hour. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Thank you.